Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. Not necessarily in that order. We do like to mix things up a bit. And uh, today we have the delight to be in the uh, Bortolami Gallery, uh, which was formerly from Chelsea, now is in Tribeca, on Walker Street in Tribeca, with Claire, who is going to guide us through this Danielle Borian exhibit. He's one of the top artists in France. Now here's what happened. Here's why we're here. Okay, I was sitting in my favorite Hoboken cafe Friday afternoon sipping my coffee reading the New York Times art section on this exhibit and she said that uh, Daniel Buren is very inspired by Marcel Duchamp. Uh, did I say that right? Duchamp? Sometimes I say Duchamp. And people say, no, it's Duchamp, right? Duchamp, okay. I have a friend who criticizes me. Duchamp, Duchamp, okay, Duchamp. So anyway, I'm a big fan of Duchamp. Uh, you know, he's just so quirky and interesting. He had that exhibit uh, where he just put a urinal into a art show in 1917 and said, that's my work, and that's it. You know, and it was like a scandal. People went running out of the, of the gallery because there was a urinal. Oh my God, this guy's nuts, you know. But that's my kind of guy. And we we think that's interesting. And that evolved into the ready-mades, and somehow this work here absorbs that quality, the resemblance to a beach cabana, or, you know, or, or an, an awning of a small business, you know. So uh, that, I've said enough so far. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Claire, who actually knows something about art, because she studied this subject. And we, what we try to do, Claire, is to educate our public about art, to be less afraid of art, to sort of learn a little something about vocabulary and, and just the sense that they can encounter a work of art and what it means. And, and, and just by knowing something, it helps us digest and interpret uh, the, the work of art and, and, and to sort of embrace art in their lives. So welcome, Claire, to the Public Voice Salon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I guess I'll start by touching on your comment about Buren at being related to Duchamp's ready-made. So it is ready-made in the sense that the stripes that Buren is so well known for, um, he was inspired by the awnings over Parisian cafes in the 60s. So in 1965, he had been painting stripes by hand mm -hmm. in the studio, mm -hmm. and then went to a Parisian market and found the fabric that was used to cover those awnings and realized that the work had essentially already been done for him. So he took that motif, which was exactly 8.7 centimeters in width, and never stopped using it. So it's been over 50 years of him using the same motif over and over again. He has never deviated from it and has found hundreds of thousands of different ways to use that motif. Wow. Now this building that we're in, it's, is it one of those like former factory buildings? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. um, before we moved in here, there was a municipal office um, and we had that this building has these columns. Yeah. Um, you can see one column they left over there in the back. If you can see that, Claudia, dear, you see the column. Yeah, so all of these are covered with uh, this, fa this fabric, is it? Um, well, these particular columns are made out of MDF and painted, okay. um, but the original stripes that Buren used were in the late 60s were on this particular canvas, on this fabric that they used to cover the awnings. Um, he stopped using canvas or painting on canvas in the early 80s. He actually hasn't painted in, in at least 30 years on canvas. Um, so he's used a variety of other materials. And in this case, it's MDF panel. Uh, Marcel Duchamp, who I do know something about, um, in 1917, he very famously went to the top of the Washington Square Arch and had a picnic there with his comrades, and, and they declared the Greenwich Village to be an independent country. I don't know if you know, that, that, that it, it was called the Arch Conspiracy. And this year is the 100th anniversary of the Great Arch Conspiracy. And so we're sort of timely here. Uh, any conspiracies going on around here? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> not that I know <laughs> Does Daniel Borean have that kind of Duchamp-esque uh, bad boy quality about him? Is he, is he a rebel? 
Is he like an icon class type of a guy? Or? Um, I should think so. Uh, in one of the more famous instances of him using the stripes was in the early 70s. He was invited to be part of an exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum here in New York and was invited to display his work alongside his compatriots that were interested in minimalism. So artists like Donald Judd and Carl Andre. Um, the idea was that one could see the work from across the across the atrium. This is a large circular building. Daniel's installation was an enormous banner of stripes that went from floor to ceiling and split the building in two. Um, the other artists were so upset by it that they demanded it be taken down, which it was. So in the late in during that time, Daniel was definitely a controversial figure, not just among other you know, people who looked at art, but also artists themselves. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So what we want to do is move a little bit through the space, because I think part of the uh, dynamic of this work is that the way it looks from different angles. Is that correct? Absolutely. So Claudia, my darling wife, is going to pick up this camera and move us around uh, through the space. Uh, we are. We wish we had a lighter camera, but it's not too heavy. No, Claudia is doing fine. Uh, now, uh, look at this angle here. Um, and let's uh, get us to, we're maybe turn toward us, my dear. Uh, yeah, follow us around, okay. Uh, what, what, what is the whole idea of the visual dynamic as you move around through the space? Um, well, the idea is that it changes from all angles. Okay. So these columns are, well, they have four sides and they each have a different color on each side. They're all primary colors, so mm. red, yellow, blue, and then on the back side of each column are these iconic 8.7 centimeter stripes that Daniel is so well known for. Mm. Um, the idea is that not only does the work change from any which angle, but also that you know conceptually, primary colors, if you have all three, you can make any color possible. So that's an idea that Daniel is also interested in. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Claire, since we just met like five minutes ago, uh, and your whole entree into the art world, and how did you first get interested in wanting to pursue a career in art? Uh, this is the epicenter of the art world here in New York City. How did, a little bit about your becoming uh, an aesthetic person. Uh. Oh, sure. Um, I studied art history in college. Which was? Which college? Where? Yeah. At uh, the University of California at Santa Cruz. Okay. All right. And... Um, I started working in a small museum in New York after that. Okay. Um, worked for an art advisor uh -huh. after that. Okay. Went back to school, uh -huh. did my graduate degree in art history, uh -huh. and then decided I wanted to work with artists. So I came to work in galleries. And what, what, what's been your take of this show so far what, in terms of the meaning for you and for other people? And what are some of the reactions to the work, to this work here? I think everybody is astonished by it. Yeah. Um, this is our first show in this space, so it's a really great way for us to, you know, get involved in the area, you know, really make a splash. For me personally, it's a real exciting thing because you learn about Daniel Buren in art history. Uh, as an undergraduate, I learned about our Daniel Buren, so it's really exciting for me to be able to be a part of this exhibition. Did he come here? Did he give a talk here at all? Was he here? Was he part of the opening? Was there like a, a big opening, a wine and cheese thing, or was it? A, was it? A, was it? No cheese. No cheese. He's French. What happened? Why no cheese? <laughs> We had a dinner afterward, and there dinner. was cheese. Okay. There was Wonderful. cheese. There was cheese involved, folks. Okay, that's good. Um, well, this is wonderful, and uh, you know, we are. Uh, one of the people we like to quote a lot is John Dewey, who uh, was a great education philosopher, who said that the aesthetic is the opposite of the anesthetic. And it's, you know, the anesthetic puts you to sleep, mm. and the aesthetic wakes you up. So having a, like an encounter with a work of art, whether, whether that work of art is a film, whether it's a novel, whether it's a painting, or whether it's an sort of an avant-garde work of art like this, that people don't expect this to be a work of art, can actually make you feel more alive and more in the moment. And so we think that's important. And we're, Dewey was also a big advocate of uh, you know, education reform. And we're concerned in our show, because we're about education and art, 
and social change. I, we may be the only show that combines those three elements because they all sort of go together. I mean, naturally, you would think. But uh, in terms of you know education, so, you know, the, there is a trend that they're taking the arts out of education now. And uh, so we, if you had any thoughts on that in terms of... Uh, how, how, is the, how is the population going to be uh, uh, educated aesthetically? So it's not just sort of a, a, a narrow elite thing where people go and where it's more of a broad within the population. And any, any, any thoughts about that, about art and education? I mean, having studied art and art history, I think it's incredibly important yeah. from a personal standpoint. Yeah. But I also feel that, you know, art is something that enriches us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for that reason alone, I think that you know, art is incredibly important to just being human. Mm, mm. So there's a huge, and I, we think there's a turning away from the humanities now, you know, there's like sort of a technocratic aspect of education. These charter schools that are proliferating, they, 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 they don't know how to say the word art. They don't know how to say the word democracy, you know. So we like to put together democracy and art and education and bring that all together and, and, and empower people. Um, do you have any, any stories about people in here, any encounters you may have had with people, any conversations? You know, how, how do people react when they see this work? Are, are some of them confused by it, maybe? Or Well, I think certainly people are confused by it. Yeah. I think that, you know, we've relocated from Chelsea to Tribeca. Yeah. There's not very, there are a few galleries down here. It's starting to yeah. be on the upswing. Um, but people come in here really, again, astonished by what they've seen. Um, and it's you know a really wonderful contrast to be out in the streets, to be in the subways, to whatever it is that you're doing, and then come in here and you know, people spend you know, 20, 30 minutes in here just wandering around. Um, so I think that that's great. I think that's really great that people are spending as much time as they are in here just to have a sort of different experience than what they're normally used to having. And I wonder what it does to their senses. I wonder what it does to one's sense of perception. I'm interested in the connection between psychology and art as well, you know. What is the meaning that you extract from it and how does one become more aware, just from a perception standpoint, of the colors around us in the world. Many people walk through life in a kind of sense of numbness. I think art can also awaken us from that numbness. So maybe in what way can can this, you know, enrich one's eyes, you know, one's, you know, strengthen one's eyes when you're out there. It's always about that, you know, how does it, how does it uh, transform one potentially or, or, or not? Well, I think that it, uh, this work, this work in particular, I think you can focus on either one column or you can yeah. focus on a multitude of columns. It makes you look up, it makes you look down. Yeah. It makes you yeah. cir walk in circles. Um, let's walk in circles. Come on, let's sure. walk around. As a Claudia, can we do that here? Okay, yeah. Let's uh, let's walk this way. To see. Well, I think what's really remarkable about it is that when you manage to turn around, that's when you really see the stripes. That's when you really see the effect of the installation. It kind of reminds me of like 3D glasses or something, or what are those things you look through and things change? I can't think of the name of it, but it's, uh, it's sort of a game-like quality, almost like a, you have to participate, you have to engage, you have to move. So it, it, it promotes fluidity and movement. And, and then if there's another person here, right, you can see somebody peeking behind a, you know. It's a little bit of a game of hide and seek, yeah. Yeah, the social aspect of it. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, this is cool. We're so happy to be here with you and in this dialogue. Um, Claire, we hope that this is a beginning also. We'd like to continue and maybe come back and film other people. We notice you have a lot of uh, colleagues and comrades in the office around the table. You know, this, this would be very conducive to dialogue, to, to sort of educate, to help us educate our public, if you will, about, about the wonders of art and to not be intimidated. I think a lot of people, they get, ooh, you know, there's so much to know and then they get to, and some people act defensively against modern art, would you say, and they just dismiss it all as hocus pocus? Well, I mean, a lot of the people that come in here, I think, already kind of yeah. have signed up. They bought into it already. Bought into it. So uh, I think that if we can get more people into it, then we have more buyers.
Yeah, but then also we have to think about the, the critique of art as a power thing where, you know, for centuries only the wealthy elites had the work of art in the castle, right? You had to go to the castle and see the painting and then, and then of course they came into museums and now the art world of course has big, big money in it and there's that whole conversation about democracy and art. How do you weigh in on that? Well, I think that, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that galleries are actually free and open to the public. Yeah. They, there's no price of admission. You can yeah. just walk in. Yeah. So it is unique in that aspect. Yeah. I've taught at uh, colleges in the New York City metro area, at community colleges, where a lot of my students were black, Latino, low-income kids, you know, and I would talk about the Chelsea galleries and say, you know, guys, you want, a, uh, you want a cheap date? You want something interesting to do? Just go to these galleries and look around, and, and it's, just, it's just amazing. You know, your life could change uh, by something you might discover, and uh, who knows? It could, it could lead to something, and uh, so we're glad that these, that these galleries are, are free. Um, and, uh, and then I would say, go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but it's $20. I say, give them a penny. Give them a penny. They can't turn you away. They can't turn you away. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. So let's look over to the windows here, uh, Claire. There's uh, sort of an urban, uh, gritty uh, vibe back there at these windows here. I'm very enchanted by these windows back here. Uh, they look up at these buildings that are very, very New York, you know, very Gotham, okay? So uh, how do you incorporate that into the space? What is the meaning of that? Well, um, I, at least in this particular case, Daniel chose to put an artwork. In the window. Okay. I mean, that's the the gels, these colorful gels. That's another artwork of Daniel's. Um, so, you know, we did not. Again, when we moved into this space, yeah. this window was actually blacked out. The last occupants had them completely blocked. So. Um, when we opened them and put this installation in, there's no way we could have known exactly mm. what it was going to look like. Mm. Um, in the mornings, it's really quite beautiful because the sun passes straight through these windows and right. casts these really beautiful colors oh, all over wow. the gallery. Oh, um, so it's, it's, it's mm. interesting. We haven't really I haven't looked at the buildings much. Yeah. I've been really more occupied with the colors right. more than anything else. I feel like that cabana feeling at the beach now with sure. the colors up there. Mm -hmm. And the stripes too. And the stripes. Wow. Now, if you look up at the fire escapes, Claudia, can you zoom in on a fire escape? Dear? That is such a New York ambiance, you know, the fire escape, the gritty New York. And I love those, those star things, whatever they are. They're like, uh, can you zoom in on one of those like star things, baby? It's like a metal, something that's it's very old. It's very classic New York, old type of thing. Wow, wow. Cool. So do you have any other, uh, any other thoughts you would like to share openly without me asking a question? Instead of breaking away, we, we, we like to... Um, be not an interview show. We think the interview is very 20th century. You know, we, we are, we are, this is the 21st century and we think it should be about dialogue, not interviews. So we don't, we don't put our pedestal, you know, our, our pedestals on guests. No, we don't put our guests on pedestals. We want us, you and I are both together here. So if you have any question for me or anything you want to share to our public about you, about the show, about art, you're welcome to do that. Sure. I mean, I'm just yeah. a, I think this is a fantastic show. I yeah. want people to see it. Um, yeah. We're really, really proud of it. Yeah. How long have you been doing this show for? Seven years. Oh, really? And do you typically do these in galleries or in museums or? We do it, uh, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes these dialogues we do it, like we'll do it in somebody's home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we'll have like a salon. We recently had a salon in somebody's home in Chelsea with a modern dancer and two of his friends. So we like to do that. We've we filmed in academic offices. We filmed on the streets of Hoboken, which is where Claudia and I live in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, we filmed in parks in New York City. If you have any idea for where we could film, if you want to give us a new suggestion, we're open to, uh, to ideas. Maybe try some of the sculpture commissions along the High Line. The High Line would be great. We love the High Line. There are a few new. I I believe there are a few new installations on the High Line. If they're not there already, they're, they're coming up. Claudia, let's write that down on our list. The High Line. <laughs>
Cool. What are your favorite places in New York? Mm, probably Lincoln Center is one of my favorites. Do you like the music? Do you like the theater? Do you like the what aspect of it? Uh, I really love music and I love opera. Really? Any any favorite operas? Um, I went to Die Rose and Cavalier recently and quite liked that. And um, I'll be going to Midsummer Night Swing in a couple of weeks. Midsummer Night Swing. Wow. Well, I like the Shakespeare play, and I guess that's going to be fun and romantic and outdoors and New York-y. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you grew up in, in? I grew up in Connecticut, not far from here. Oh, my Aunt Bobby, she's uh, 87 years old, lives in Bridgeport, Connecticut, in the Black Rock section. We love to go visit her there. My grandmother grew up in Fairfield, Connecticut, so I have uh, Connecticut roots myself. And um, so w when did New York become a place for you, uh, as a child or later on? Sure, as a child. I, okay. My father worked in the city. I liked coming here. I liked going to museums when I was really young. Mm. And I knew I wanted to work in art, so I just moved back this way after college. Cool. And talk about your dream in the art world now. Maybe you could have just a share, if you want to. You know, what is it that you want to do, achieve? What do you see yourself in the future of the art world? I don't know. I'm okay. just open. I'm learning. Uh -huh. That is my future, is learning. As we all are, folks. We're all learners. We're all amateurs. We're, you can never know it all. You know, that's the thing about art. There's always, I call it the great unfinished conversation. You know, you and I could walk away enriched somehow by having our conversation. People could be enriched watching our show, be intrigued by Daniel Buren and Google him and read his Wikipedia site and, uh, and come to this gallery uh, uh, on Walker Street. H how has been the transition from, from uh, Chelsea to Tribeca? It's been pretty smooth, I think. I mean, we moved here pretty quickly, and the neighborhood has really welcomed us. We love our space, we love our street. Um, still working out some little kinks here and there, but it's been really nice. Uh, any other works of art, like in terms of uh, literature or theater, that you wanted to, you know, talk about or comment on? We like to bring together all the arts and see the arts as being in a dialogue. Like you mentioned, opera. So now we have opera and we have sculpture and we have how do the, how do the arts work together in a kind of a dialogue or, or, or the cinema, films, any film, favorite films? You have a favorite film. Favorite films. Uh, it's tough. It's Hollywood, tough. you're doing a lousy job. Let me just point my finger at Hollywood. Hollywood is doing a lot. She doesn't have a favorite film. I got an idea for a favorite film. Jean-Luc Godard. Are you familiar with his work? Yes. He's one of my favorites. So French cinema mm -hmm. is also one of my favorites. I wonder if Mr. Buren, I wonder if he's a, a cinephile. I'm sure he knows some, a thing or two about it. Um, mm. Speaking of interdisciplinary sort yeah. of things. Daniel did design a set for a ballet oh, okay. for um, Daphne and Chloe, which was performed at Lincoln Center a couple of months ago, actually. Right, right. So he yes. has wow. done both um, public commissions, he's done set design, he's oh. done tons of museum shows, so he's pretty well-rounded. Now, Daphne and Chloe was one of the great romantic stories from the Middle Ages. Um, and uh, I'm reading Goethe now, Goethe, the Buildings Roman, uh, yeah, the apprenticeship of uh, Wilhelm Meister. And uh, so I'm trying to add to my education that way. But uh, so, yeah, it has been a delight to be in dialogue with you here, uh, Claire, at this uh, wonderful exhibit in uh, Tribeca. Say the name of the gallery again. Bortolami. Bortolami. Bortolami Gallery uh, with uh, Claire and Claudia enjoying the work of Danielle Burian. Did I say that right? Buren. Buren. Okay. Not, not Martin Van Buren. There's no relationship to President Martin Van Buren. Okay, that's right. French culture. Good stuff. French culture, French learn, grow our audience, come to Tribeca, go to museums, read. We know that Donald Trump doesn't read, he's our president, but we encourage reading and we encourage growth and intellectual growth. And uh, Claudia is waving me, I'm being too controversial. We're about social change too. Social change means you can talk about things like that, that we need to have an intellectual life. And we think that... Uh, 
Claudia wants to say something. Go ahead, baby. Christo, you mean? Claudia just asked about the Gates, which was a, the great public right. exhibit in Central Park. I think that was about 10 years ago now, going back about 10 years. So is there any connection between Christo and, uh, and Mr. Buren? Um, there could very well be. They're of the same generation. Okay. Um, Daniel is in his late 70s, so it's very likely that they know each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they were both coming up at the same time. So, uh, except Christo was, I think, here in the United States, mm -hmm. and Daniel has been in France his whole life. So it's. Wow. Claudia, that was a very good question, dear. That, that was a better question than any of my questions today. So I want to give Claudia the, the, the best question of the day award. Um, so. Uh, yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you so much, Claire, for being with us. I know you have to get back to work, but uh, we really appreciate you taking time out. Of course. My pleasure. Now we're with Paul at Bortolami in the project room, and there's something else going on in here, something very unusual. We have papers on the floor, but no, the room is not dirty. The room is not dirty. Don't send the cleaning room in, oh, away. You know, we just, This is part of the exhibit. This is some interesting things on the wall. What is going on here, Paul? Uh, so this is a project called Bibolo by an Argentinian artist called Nicolas Guanini. Mm. Um, he is born in Buenos Aires, but has lived and worked in uh, New York since the mid-1990s. He's a uh, theorist, critic, and conceptual artist. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a miniature version of a, a project that we realized uh, in March in, in Chelsea, in our previous location. Um, Guanini is uh, often trying to uh, elevate the exhibition text into a, a work on its own or actually a component in the exhibition. Um, he's, uh, in some of his previous projects, he's actually mounted the uh, exhibition text to the walls, floor to ceiling, and we pasted them. In this case, uh, we, he's kind of white boxed the space entirely by actually uh, uh, putting uh, hundreds of copies of the exhibition text onto uh, the gallery floor. And these small um, wall-mounted works that you're looking at come from his Bibolo series. Um, Guanini's been making ceramic sculptures for um, the past few years now. Um, and while he's a conceptual artist, he has become quite an accomplished ceramicist in, along, along the way. Um, and they grew out of test tiles that he would be making in order to develop glazes for some of the sculptures that I mentioned. So that's where he came up with this concept, which are actually faux canvases in ceramic. Okay, let's take a look. created a uh, ceramic uh, faux, faux canvas mold. So uh, while it appears to be a canvas, you have these uh, nails here and uh, the, the mold of a, giving the impression of a stretched canvas. Um, it's actually a solid piece of, of glazed uh, ceramic. Fascinating. With some text on there. Yes. Uh, the text uh, comes from a, a graffito by Guy Debord, the Situationist. Uh, 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 the Situationist, and it was something that was was scrawled on a um, on an embankment of the Seine in the 1950s. Um, 
but it became the uh, interestingly the subject of a kind of an intellectual property uh, scandal or, or case in, in the uh, 1960s. But anyway. Um, but the situation is for our viewers who might not know, was a radical group of uh, French uh, uh, activists, intellectuals. I think they, there was only about 35 of them, but they, know, they, they had a powerful impact on French politics, in particular the 1968 uprising. Am I being correct with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this this is a, a major uh, touchstone for for Nick and his in his his thinking and in his uh, his practice as an artist. Um, but uh, these 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 paintings, interestingly, um, you know, being this kind of critic of late capitalism that Nick is, he's made, is they're, they're they're part of an effort to kind of monetize every. Uh, aspect of the production. So as I was, as I had mentioned, these it's paradoxical. These grew, these grew out of test tiles, right? For for other works, um, but they're sort of the perfect sellable um, size. They are kind of uh, have a borderline camp, you know, very uh, desirable, um, you know, very, for attractive attractive glazes. Um, and um, also this uh, you know, beautiful uh, decal in Travail Jamais, which is often uh, rendered in gold and silver and platinum. I'm against capitalism now. Give me $20 million for my work now. Um, let's take a look at these. I like these cartoon bubbles over here, Paul. What's going on with the cartoon bubbles? Because people love, you know, it's like you can think about what could be there, who's talking. There's a kind of a mystery here. Uh, it could be, it could be me, maybe, saying something, hopefully intelligent sounding, or just not blah 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 blah. What do you think? Uh, they're called He Said, She Said, okay. um, and they're actually, uh, well, at least the, the two on, on uh, the, the right-hand side of the wall here are, are, are based on, on text message uh, oh. bubbles. Oh. Are you a texter? Yes. I'm not a texter. <laughs> I have never texted. Well, And I shall not text. <laughs> I am holding the line on texting. But anyway, I'm not against texters. Texters do their thing. I'm just saying that for me, texting is just one extra thing I don't need to have in my life. So I'm confessing to you and the world about my anti-texting proclivities. Now, by next week, I might be texting. I don't know. Well, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Give me a smartphone, and we'll talk about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, this stuff, can I just show what this is that I'm standing on, just to show the text? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, a, te it's a text by Jenny Jasky called I Love Nick. Uh-huh. I Love Nick. Nick, Nick short for, for Nicholas, for the, for the artist whose, whose project we're inside right now. And this is by Jenny Jasky. Oh, so this is a friend of Nick's wrote this text. Yes. There's all ways of commenting on art, and we do it in writing, we do it in dialogue, and it's all part of the art world. And uh, Paul, just briefly, you could tell us something about yourself, and you know, so our viewers get a sense of who you are, and uh, where did you study art, and where you grew up? Uh, I grew up in, in New York City. Okay. Um, I uh, studied fine art history. Mm. Um, and I have been uh, dealing in contemporary art um, for uh, nine years now. Wow, wow. Is this your first time on television or? No, I think I actually did Korean television in like really? 2008 oh. or something like that. It was like uh, maybe, maybe uh, the first or second exhibition at, at, at a gallery I, I, had, I had just started mm. at. Um, mm. Anyway. You, are you happy to be on television? Is it something, a medium that you enjoy? Some people like it, some people don't. Uh, um, I think I'm okay. I think you're doing fine. You're a very articulate, bright young man, and we do appreciate you being with us uh, today. Thank you so much. And you said you just got in on a red eye, so you're tired, so. But. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Paul. Thank you.
So now we're with Emma. She's a very lovely person in this wonderful gallery uh, who actually answered the phone when I called and she was so polite and so open to this adventure of us coming in here. So uh, Emma, tell us a little bit about the treasures of this room that we're in right now. Sure. So um, okay. this, or, or you hold it. Um, so this is our viewing room. Um, we bring clients in here and we usually have a different variety of all the artists that we work with. Um, so this is a real mix um, of different artists from our program. All around the world, they come right through here in this room. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> it must be a learning experience. You must, I mean, it must be, may, I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall, Emma. You would see a lot of different artworks. And what's up now? What's behind me? This says, we'll take any work. What does that mean? We'll take any work? Claudia is a photographer. Will you take her work? Sure. Um, so this is a painting by Anna Astoya, who's okay. a Polish artist um, based in New York. And this Get is out a, of the way. Okay. Yeah. This is a painting uh, that's based on a photograph um, that's on the cover of a book about capitalism. About so, capitalism. Oh. Uh, so it's a picture of a man who's holding a sign saying that he'll take any work, and then behind him um, is this picture of a um, of a bride in a shop window. Um, so there's this great disparity between someone who's looking for work and someone who's wearing like the trappings of wealth and um, status. Ooh, radical message. Definitely. Um, yeah, a lot of her work sort of is done in this um, almost cubist mm. style. Um, and there's a relationship uh, that she's constantly exploring between um, photography and painting. Um, so this is a work by Lena Henke, who's one of the um, newer artists that we've started working with. Uh, she's a German artist based in New York in her early 30s. Um, and this is from a series of works she's made recently called Milk Drunk. So they're molds um, used to cast breasts. Um, so the, this is made of acrylic and resin, and these are um, rubber bands that sort of keep it all together. And this is the plate used to form like a back. So you can actually, when you buy this, there's a whole kit that she gives you to make these sand casts of breasts. And um, we showed them in the, you can see marks on the floor actually from where we did it. But um, there, we made all of these casts of breasts, and she just had a, um, an um, exhibition. She just had um, an exhibition in Basel. Uh -huh. um, there's a section of Art Basel ca called Parkour, mm -hmm. and she made all these works, including these like casts of breasts that were everywhere. It was really amazing. Wow. Now, do women volunteer to have their breasts casted, or who does she choose? Who does she? They're not. They're not. It's not a real breast. I mean, that was not a model yeah, of a real breast. Yeah. She okay. just. She sculpts them herself. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's move over here to this colorful piece here. This joyful piece here. Yeah. Um. So this is a. On the side. Okay. This is a painting by Ivan Morley. Okay who is an artist based in Los Angeles. Um, a lot of people know his works that are made with thread and embroidery. Um, and this is one that's just uh, oil paint. But of course, he has a very inventive uh, technique for painting. Um, he paints onto a glass surface, uh, like a sign painter. So. Th Whatever is at the front of the canvas is what he put down on the glass first, and then he built upon that and built upon it and built upon it, oh. and then put a piece of fabric over the back of that surface and pulled the whole composition off of the glass. So you'll notice if you get up close that the surface of this painting is actually very flat because oh. it was created on this glass surface, and then it was stretched over this Cool. I, I feel a cartoony feeling from this. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of his work uh, comes out of cartoons and um, Americana culture. And 
pop sensibility. And what about your? Yeah. Yes, what about your background in art? Um, I studied art history, and I've been working in galleries since I graduated from college. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And what is your uh, goal in the future in terms of the art world? Um, I, I'm pretty happy just working in galleries. I just like to get more advanced at that and yeah. work with more artists and mm -hmm. um, put on interesting exhibitions that people want to see. Good luck with all that. Thank you. All right. Let's move around. Let's see. There's a, there's a collage here uh, on that door. Uh, it's uh, some papers of, uh, looks like, uh, cut out of a magazine or... Exactly. Um, so this is a work called Architectural Digest mm -hmm. by Tom Burr. And these are actual pages from Architectural Digest. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of his work is assemblage and mm -hmm. um, collage, like collected imagery and objects. So this is a door um, from the house that he grew up in, oh. in the Northeast. So you have this like wow. very vernacular mm -hmm. um, architectural detail mixed with this very kind of elaborate, ornate, um, architectural detail from the magazine, like this very aspirational mm. um, decor. It's a great old door. I love it. It's uh, yeah. like a Norman Rockwell type. Uh, totally, totally. Wow. So this sort of like deep Americana yeah. sensibility with like this European aspirational mm. imagery. I think you like Americana as well, or I like both. <laughs> To get a sense on your proclivities, oh, also. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm from the United States, so. Yeah. That's yeah. our history, right? Exactly. Let's learn it. Let's learn it. Okay. Let's look over this. This is another piece here, a little more abstract, yeah. a little de Kooning, de Kooning esque. Hold on, let me just swing around here. Okay. Let me just come with you here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think you can see that kind of influence in the work. Um, some people, when they look at this, they see, like, you know, some of the mark-making styles of Basquiat. Basquiat, oh, Basquiat, one of the great of all yeah. time. We lost him way too young. He was only 28 years old. He was from this neighborhood, okay, right? He was from around here. He was from downtown. I'm Mikhail Basquiat. We loved him, okay. Um, so, this is a painting by Richard Aldrich, um, who is, I think, one of the greatest younger painters that we have um, in the United States right now. And um, how old is he? He's in his early forties. Okay. I think he's young for a painter, right? Yeah. Um, so he tends to work on this large scale or on a much smaller scale. But his large scale paintings are very heterogeneous so mm. some of them have this kind of intense sort of gestural abstraction mm. and others are way more muted uh, some of his canvases are more sculptural than they are like painting they'll actually mm. have no paint on them they'll just be mm. um, the artist will cut into the canvas to reveal like the stretcher bars beneath or like he sometimes attaches objects to the surface of the canvas and uses it just as a place for mm. um, making a sculptural gesture as opposed to like an imagistic gesture. Now, as I'm listening to you, I'm realizing I'm not understanding everything, but that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm giving myself permission. Um, but just the language is so beautiful and it makes me realize what I don't know. And you know, and, and how, how important language is to understanding a work of art. John Dewey said that. John Dewey said that the more you know about a work of art, the more you understand the vocabulary or something about how it's put together, the more you can experience it and see what's there to be seen and to feel. Uh, I think I have to go back to my Arthur Danto, the great uh, critic Arthur Danto wrote uh, wonderful uh, you know, uh, books about, about art and, and A.O. Scott also wrote a wonderful book about, about art. But you, 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 you got the lingo, you got the language, it's, fa it's very impressive, you know, yeah. Um. Yeah, well, I think, you know, mm. an image is worth a thousand words, but, but you need the words. I think that's how we communicate ideas to each other. Like so. the word that I got stuck on was hetero... Heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. Let's so they all look very different. 
Okay. All, all of his paintings look very different. So that's what heterogeneous means. Yeah. See, our folks, we as opposed to homogenous. As opposed to homogenous, which is the same. I yeah. gotcha. Cool. We learned something today, folks, in Tribeca <laughs> from Emma. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Uh, so let's take another just quick pan around. Uh, this the last piece here, okay. Uh, it's really hard to describe. Yeah. I'm sure you'll do a good job. <laughs> Uh, so this is a series of photographs by Barbara Caston. Um, uh -huh. She's an 81-year-old American photographer. Um, she sort of rose to popularity later in her life. Um, and these are a re this is a recent body of work called Double Negative. Um, so she's known for taking very humble objects in her studio and creating these um, sculptural compositions mm. and then lighting them in kind of dramatic ways and then photographing them. Uh, but there's something about how she photographs them that makes it difficult mm. to sense like what the scale of the objects are. There's yeah. something quite spatially disorienting about the images. Mm. Um, so these are called double negative because mm. the, so in the photographic process there's a negative uh -huh. from which you print the photograph and that's mm -hmm. the positive. Mm. But these are the negative of oh. that. Oh. Again, so oh. there's this doubling of the negative. Makes you think about the whole process in a more concrete way. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of her work has to do with um, medium specificity, which means like the specific properties of photography itself. Oh. It's a medium she loves, uh, apparently, or? Yeah. Definitely. Wow, wow, wow. So this has been a pleasure and a delight to be with you here. Let's just take a peek in the room and see how our, uh, your colleagues are doing, if we can, just one second. Sure. We're going to just peek in there. OK. Let's go around this way. Hold it. OK, we got it. Yeah. We're going to walk through here, here. So I want to just uh, thank everybody here at this wonderful gallery for uh, allowing us to be in here. This is the inner sanctum of the art world. We want folks watching to see this incredible people working together, collaborating, and on the highest level. Uh, very fascinating. Uh, peek inside this incredible guy. If you want to say something, you can. You don't have to say anything. We could just be in awe of the moment. Um, as you look outside the street, you see the streetscape out there. You can see the streetscape out there. Someone's got the giggles. That's a good thing. Paul has the giggles. Paul has the giggles. Get that. Paul has the giggles. Now, now let's <laughs> turn around and look at this work here. This is a beautiful work here. Can anybody say anything about that amazing work? Yeah, yeah so this is the painting. <laughs> Sorry. For us, it's all new and exciting, guys. For you, it's a day at the, at the office, right? Okay. So this is a painting by you two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Laughter is a good thing. We promote that. Okay. <clears throat> this is a painting by you to Coter. Um, it's a, a representation of a press image that was taken when Queen Elizabeth um, met Angelina Jolie and gave her a Medal of Honor for all of her humanitarian work. She didn't come here, Queen Elizabeth, did she? No. This, so this oh, okay. is based on an image uh, that, that was taken in oh, Buckingham Palace. Yes, 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 so yes. actually, if you look at the original photograph, it's very similar to that, Beautiful. Uh, minus the color scheme, obviously. Um, and Yuta is a German artist. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm and has been working um, in this color palette for many years now. And it comes from um, her interest in Cezanne. Cezanne, ah, okay, one of the greats, one of the greats. Interesting. And how long has it been there on that wall? Is it? Uh... Um, just since we've moved. Okay. And we've only been here for just over a month, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this has been such a delight and pleasure to visit with you all here today. We've really enjoyed it, and we'll enjoy watching it again and learning from that and sharing this with other people. Uh, and uh, But we just want to just step outside, if you can, and we want to sure. see how the street looks on this Tribeca. 
So here we are in Tribeca, New York City, uh, one of the uh, centers of the art world here with Emma uh, at Bortolami Gallery outside now, getting the streetscape with the wind blowing and see some trees in the background there. Doesn't get any more in New York than this. It's like, I feel like, uh, who's the Sex in the City uh, gal? Uh, what's Carrie what's Bradshaw. Carrie Bradshaw is going to come by any minute and you're going to go out for Cosmos. Co <laughs> Cosmos. And I'll be like, you know, all right. Hopefully you'll invite us along. Me and Claudia can come for Cosmos. Definitely. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, a little bit about your experience in the neighborhood. And uh, so we just moved to Tribeca from Chelsea. Um, and so far we love it. It's a really beautiful neighborhood. Wow. Um, there's a lot of fantastic architecture. Um, we love the architecture of our building. Um, it's like a really perfect place for showing art. Mm. And we have these amazing columns outside that we've yeah. covered in stripes, um, which is the trademark of Danielle Buren. And they'll be up for the next couple of years. So you have a very close relationship with Buren. Uh, he's one of the artists that we've been working with the longest and so we wanted to give him our first show at the new gallery and then also to have this um, sort of be a legacy of that show. Uh, Claudia, how much time do we have left here? Three minutes left, so we have three glorious minutes if you have any final thoughts, reflections. Um, just that I hope people come downtown and yeah. visit us. There's so much to do in Tribeca and there's a lot to see here. Our gallery, our exhibition changes every yeah. month and a half. Yeah. So if you just like take a look at our website, you can see what's coming up. Um, and you can also look at artists that we've shown in the past and images of their exhibitions. Um, there's a lot going on. Wow. And the Tribeca Film Festival is down here too with Mr. Robert De Niro. Yeah. Has he been by, Robert De Niro? Not yet, but you should tell him to come by. Robert, what are you doing? Come on. Come on over. You made enough movies, Robert. Get into art. Get, make a movie about art. Do you know Robert De Niro's father was a painter? I did know that. See that? Another reason he's got to come down here, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this has been a delight, and the weather is perfect, and it's just so nice to be here with you. And what are your plans uh, this summer? I mean, you want to talk a little bit about it? Uh, well, we have a new, our new show um, yeah. is going to be by Tom Burr and Andrea Zatel. Okay. Um, so that's opening on June 29th. Yeah. And then at the same time, we have an off-site project in New Haven with Tom Burr um, in this gorgeous building that was designed by Marcel Breuer. It's this incredible brutalist masterpiece. I love brutalist art. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. I, brutalist architecture is incredible. Um, ah. So no one's really been in this building for the last 15 years. And ah. Tom is doing a, a sculptural installation inside the building. So I've been working on that with him. And that's opening on July 9th and 10th. Wow. Yeah. Now, have you been to the new Whitney yet? Whitney. Of course. We have not. Claudia and I, I'm going to confess, we were, it's on our list of things to do, but we have not. You go. You have to go. We live in Hoboken, so we sit by the waterfront and we see the skyline, and we can see the Whitney, and it looks fantastic. It kind of has a brutalist type of an architecture in a way, right? It has a kind of an industrial aesthetic. Yeah. It's, I mean, to me, it looks like a boat. looks like a boat. Yeah. I, I think it's a gorgeous building. We're really lucky to have it in New York. Well, we wish you a long and, and wonderful, prosperous career in the world of art, and however you want to shape it or what direction you want to go. It's a lovely world to be in. It's a magical world. It's a world that we can't get enough of, and also to share this with our audience is uh, quite a thrill. And so you're a really good sport, Emma, for taking time out for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you. And anytime you want us back, you let us know, and we'll be happy to cover and show the world what's going on here at Bortolami Gallery in Tribeca with Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Now, where.
Thank you.